And Brian's going to go through uh, uh, quite a, a number of different updates in the nutrient management program. Brian? Okay, thank you, Dwight. Um, we'll go ahead and... Um, really quickly, if anyone has any questions, um, go ahead and do put them in the chat box and I'll be monitoring that as Brian goes through and we can get to those at the end of the presentation if we have time. Um, is that how you'd like to handle it, Brian? Sure. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Well, since Dwight gave me the introduction, I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to start off with kind of a review of the legislative changes from last year, just kind of remind everybody what's going on and, and the changes that happened to the annual implementation report and so forth. And as I go through, then we'll talk about the annual implementation report and some other things. But we'll start here uh, just as a review of the legislative changes that happened last year. Again, that was a, 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 a law of Senate Bill 546 that covered three, sec three different departments at one time, but I'm only going to talk about the, uh, what affects the agriculture nutrient management program at this point in time. Uh, as we all know, annual implementation reports are due March 1st of each year. We're coming around on another um, cycle of that. They should be going out in January, somewhere after the 11th of January. But um, just to kind of review what, what came up was the required, this bill required the department to add information to the AIR. And one of those things was the amount of manure imported and exported from a farm operation. Uh, for the imported side of that, you know, we needed to name the location of the sending farm. For the exported animal manure, we needed the name and location of the farm that the manure was exported to. Also, if it went to an alternative use facility, if used, and or if there was a broker that received the manure. So if that manure is received through a manure broker, the broker shall provide the operator the name and location of the sending farm. And this will apply to all organics uh, out there, manure, food, you know, food processing waste, biosolids, and so forth. Uh, so again, you know, part of the changes to this as well was the fact that the penalties for not filing or completing the AIR. Again, it was due March 1st of each year. You know, there's a warning letter. MDA gives a warning letter prior to any um, charge notices and so forth, but they, they put a, a stepped in find approach in there that 30 days after a warning letter, the operator may be fined not less than hundred hours up to 250. 60 days after the warning letter could be 250 up to a thousand. And then 90 days after that warning letter, an operator may be fined up to uh, uh, not less than a thousand dollars. Now, with that, consideration has to be given to the willfulness of the violation and the extent to which that violation was part of a reoccurrent pattern. Again, MDA has always and, and, and will continue to try to work with everybody um, in getting these annual implementation reports in. We're not interested in the fine side of it, we're interested in getting the AIR turned in, okay? So if you hold a nutrient management license or a certificate, again, part of that uh, change was that you must comply with all applicable department re reporting requirements and deadlines established by the department, including deadlines related to imp implementation of the phosphorus management tool developed by the University of Maryland, Submission of soil test phosphorus levels related to nutrient management, which we will be doing that again, beginning next summer uh, in 2021, we'll be dealing with that uh, soil submission again of, of the soil phosphorus levels, okay? And technically they added in that they could be subject to a $250 fine for not filing reports or submitting soil data at that point in time. Again, this was the legislature that enacted these things. At the same time, they went in and increased the penalties for not um, implementing or having a current nutrient management plan has been increased from the maximum of 2000, now can be up to a maximum of $5,000 as a penalty. Again, 
those things have to be, we have to take things into consideration when looking at that. Um, they also put a stipulation in that a minimum of $250 can be uh, fine for applying uh, phosphorus to a regulated field that prohibits the application of that P. Um, again, consideration has to be given to the willfulness of the violation and the extent of which that violation is part of a recurrent pattern or a same or similar type of violation. So, you know, understand that that's not the first thing that's going to happen. You know, you get plenty of notice. We give you time frames to correct things before any of this even would come into play, but it is there. Again, MDA is not interested in the fine. MDA is interested in making, you know, working with you on implementing the nutrient management plan and so forth. Uh, also, it required the department uh, additional report reporting for the department. Okay. You know, all that stuff they added to the AIR, they want to report back to the legislature, which is something we're in the process of working on now. Um, the amount of manure exported by farm operations to off alternative use facilities or other farm operations in the state. The amount of animal manure exported out of the state by the farm operations, the amount of animal manure land applied by farm operations, you know, around the state, and the reported. This information will be aggregated and reported by geographic area, you know, on the county level for the most part. Uh, we, at this point, we're not breaking it down by local watershed, but it is, you know, at a minimum, going to re be reported on a county basis. And again, it has to be done in a manner that protects the identity of the individual farm operation. Okay. So with that brought along changes to the formatting of the AIR as you knew it before um, changed to it was changed to accommodate the requirements of the manure and other organics. Um, again, just remember that the legislature is which where this was all passed and enacted and people went down and testified and all that, you know, over the bill hearings and so forth. And it came out that it was best that this be put on the annual implementation report. So again, we ask that the AIR be completely filled out. Okay. Non-compliance for forms that are submitted incomplete. You know, if you don't sign it and things like that, you don't fill out, you know, everything completely you know, it technically is incomplete and you would be hearing from somebody at MDA at that point in time. So the red kind of indicates the newer reworded question. Blue indicates what we refer to as uh, management questions and so forth. And then of course, if you need additional pages for the, uh, to complete the AIR for any of the tables, you can certainly use additional pages as needed. So this is what it looked like in 2019, and basically it, it didn't change. So the only thing that's going to change this year is the fact that it's going to say 2020 and so forth, and that it will be due March 1st of 2021. So, of course, the first page, you all pretty well know what the first page looks like. You know, it, it's got the, your farm information on it. It's going to ask you total farmed acres, what your operation type is, account IDs added and deleted, nutrient sources so forth, your plan writer information, um, as well as your animal information. Okay, so this is just a quick snapshot of what page two looks like of the printed form. Now remember, this is of the printed green form, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through and start talking about the EAI, the electronics EAIR. Um, but this is page two of the printed form. So what we, what we, what, what we did here is just the, um, these are the crop management, we, we kind of put things in sections. So we got crop production. These are our fertilizer management questions and so forth here. Um, and then we got commercial fertilizer questions as well. Uh, you know, in terms of what are you using? Are you using variable rate technology or split applications and so forth? Or, you know, acres where commercial fertilizer and so forth was incorporated within 24 hours and those types of questions. And then of course our nursery greenhouse question as well. And, and these are all used to help, you know, gauge and, and go towards some of our uh, meeting our WIP goals and so forth. So it's important that you as operators and, and consultants also explain that to your operators 
you know, we, we are using the data from this to help back up what agriculture is doing and what we're doing with that. So page two at the bottom section here is our poultry manure section. Again, for our poultry, we're asking that this be put in number or in thousands per flock. Obviously, if you have less than that, you're gonna to have to divide that back and then put the decimal of the number in there for that. Um, again, how many flocks do you have or your poultry integrator and so forth. Uh, we get down into here, our poultry litter on farm collected and stored manures in red. This was some of the newly worded questions, you know, reworded with dates and so forth to be able to answer to the legislative report and so forth. So we're looking again for the um, tons of on farm collected poultry litter um, that remains stored or stockpiled from 2018. On farm collected poultry litter that was land applied to your farm operation in 2019, the tons and acres, because we have to report the number of acres and so forth and the amount. And then of course, uh, the tons of, in, of imported poultry litter that remains stored or stockpiled from 2018 that was applied in 2019. So we're, you know, it's trying to capture all that, those possible scenarios out there. And then we have a manure management question down here, asking about acres of poultry litter incorporated within 48 hours using vertical uh, tillage equipment, you know, as an example would have been a turbo till for an example. Um, then over on the right hand side of that page, we get into our manure organics other than poultry. So no poultry information goes into this side um, at this part. Uh, again, we're asking our manure management questions related to liquid manure and so forth. And then of course our acres of manure application applied at crops at the crops phosphorus removal rate. 47, 48, and 49 are our manure organics um, on farm collected stored questions related to these types of products. So two dairy, two beef, and those other types of manures. You know, again, very similar questions. Uh, tons of on farm uh, collected manure organics. Uh, again, tons total on farm collected manure organics that remain stored or stockpiled from 2018. Again, all these are broken down into tons and gallons. That's why you see the tons and gallons there. And then we created a chart for those that are um, on farm generated manure organics that was land applied to your farm operation in 2019. Again, each one of these sections is one source. So, you know, if you may have dairy tons and dairy liquid uh, that can be listed here, um, but you might have beef manure as well that has to be used on a, a second line there. So also we're asking the total uh, imported manure organics that remain stored or stockpiled from 2018 and was land applied in 2019. So those were all newly kind of reworded and, and adjusted to meet that legislative part. So we talk about our, our uh, Third page here, which is basically the import and the export of the manure. So we'll just look at that broken down in terms of our AIR imported manure, biosolids, food waste, or other organics. We're looking for, again, in this chart, each line is a, is a separate source that you may be importing to your operation. On the paper form, if you have you know, if you didn't have any, you would just check if none. Basically, we're, we're looking that you didn't just overlook the section. We're looking for you to check that box and say, hey, I acknowledge it, but I don't, it doesn't apply to my operation uh, and so forth. And then we're looking for the name of the person, the name of the farm entity, uh, the street, the city, county, zip, what was it? And again, we're looking at the amount of it, the amount used and land applied in terms of acres for your imported. Again, this provides for three different imported materials. Use additional sheets as needed. And then we get into our exported side of things as well. Again, on the paper version, you certainly have the check if none and so forth. Uh, very similar information, except when you get over here to, to the amount, we can get the tons and gallons, but we wanna know where it was sent to, the alternative use facility, manure organics broker or other farm 
operation at that point in time. So again, there's three opportunities to do that, you know, for your exported materials as well. All right, and then page four, which is our summary of nutrient application by crop. This is not new to you or to anybody. This is where we're asking farm operators and you know, consultants, if you're working with them, you know, again, you can combine your crops to fit into these sections and so forth as accordingly. Uh, put your acres in there. We want to know the total pounds uh, of nutrients in, in, in these places, N, P, and K. So we want the actual amount of nutrients in terms of what went down. So, you know, your commercial fertilizer, right? we don't, we're not looking for the total pounds of material, we're looking for the actual nutrients. Uh, for your manure, biosolids, and other organics, this will be figured out and determined. You should be able to refer back to your nutrient management plan or adjustments to those plans and records to, to get that information as well. But again, we're looking for the actual nutrients that were applied in that case. Okay. And of course, you're signing that you acknowledge that the information is true and accurate and that you're going to have a current plan and you sign it and so forth. There is the uh, CAFO form. The, the CAFO form is basically expanded by one page at that point in time. Uh, question 20 is definitely a CAFO required question and so forth. And then of course the uh, fifth page on here, you have to do the field by field breakdown if you apply, have fields in your CAFO permit and so forth that you apply manure to, you have to fill out that section. Um, you do not have to write the analysis of your manure analysis down anymore, but you do have to attach your lab sheets to those um, and submit that with your report. And of course, indicate any unpermitted discharges and so forth. All right, so something that's been kind of in the works for, well, now working on a year, uh, we started in this process probably back in October. I got, but fully got rolling into it probably this spring, right after everything happened with COVID and, and everything really got things moving forward with that. Um, one, we had the changes to the AIR. So therefore that meant we needed database changes and things to accommodate that. So, in that process, uh, the state of Maryland, an initiative of the state of Maryland is that forms and things like that be available on the, what's known as the Maryland one-stop portal. So we have initially developed the form to capture the information and we used it to collect the data from last year's form. So this is kind of the start of our new database system as well. Uh, through this Maryland one-stop portal, okay? So from there, now we're bringing it out so that this year you would be able to go, a, a operator would be able to go to this Maryland one-stop portal, as we see here, and basically sign up on the one-stop portal by going to this website, which by the way, just so everybody's, aware, we will be mailing out the AIRs as usual. However, we are including the instructions to the Maryland one-stop portal with it so that you can go. So these very instructions that I'm talking about will be included with your AIR for those of you that want, you know, want to try to submit it. And we are encouraging you to submit it because there is going to become a time that we won't be sending out these forms. Um, we will have to deal with those with the internet issues and capabilities on a case by case basis at that point in time. But at some point, it will, you know, there'll be that situation where those forms won't be mailed and this will be your way of submitting your AIR to the department. But, you know, this year we want to unveil it, let you take it for a test drive. You know, if we find things that need to be improved, you know, within reason, obviously we'll try to, you know, take any feedback on that. But basically an operator can go to the one-stop portal, they can register, they got to put their name and their 
the, their first name, their last name, an email address in, and they got to create a password. And it has to meet the standards, you know, eight characters long with, you know, it's got to have symbols in it, got numbers and so forth. You know, all those things you do with all your other online things. Um, so you complete the requested information and then you click the register. And then basically what would happen is you'll receive an email back so that you can verify your email address. So once that happens, the next step would be then searching and submitting the annual implementation report. So at that point in time, once you've created your login, you'll be able to go on to the one-stop portable and portal and type in annual implementation report and so forth, or AIR. And then it basically what it does, it brings up all the forms related to it. Um, or you can search it by the department and so forth. You can go directly to the Maryland Department of Agriculture at that point in time uh, on the one-stop portal and, and look for the form as well. So you would select that AIR from your search results and so forth. And then you would basically click the apply online button to fill out that application at that point in time. So in talking about the electronic submission of the AIR to MDA, we, you know, when you do this, you will receive confirm a confirmation email from one stop that the AIR was received. E those emails will be sent to the email address that was registered with one stop through the registration process. Okay. The AIR will be reviewed by our regional specialists. So when you submit that electronic AIR, it will then be sent to our regional specialists out in the field. Uh, many of you know them and, and so forth. So it will go to them in email for them to review the information, okay? Uh, they will review it. And if there's any corrections needed, you know, major corrections and so forth, they would got the opportunity to send it back to you, which means the operator would get an email back saying, hey, you know, there's something wrong, you need to correct something and so forth and then resubmit that form. Once a form has been reviewed by that regional specialist and approved, the operator will receive an email to that effect that says, hey, this AIR is accepted and complete, and they'll have confirmation that all that information was you know, taken care of, that the AIR has been completely accepted by MDA, okay? And I just remind people to keep those types of emails in your records to use later um, if you need it, all right? Now, you know, some advantages to it, you know, you get to do it, at, you get to do this thing at home, you get to do it from the convenience of your home computer, so forth. You don't have to, you can save the post that you're mailing it in, you don't have to worry about it getting lost in the postal system, et cetera. You know, everybody's been in, in a situation where something has, gotten misplaced or something with the uh, post office. The fact that you get quick confirmation on whether that AIR was received and so forth, you know, is all a benefit to you. The other thing we're gonna throw out that we got is we're gonna encourage operators who have a uh, nutrient management certification or a CFO or our applicator vouchers will receive two continuing education units for successful completion of the AIR electronically. So it is a way that you can get your continuing education credits as well for operators. And then we are gonna, you know, obviously there's gonna be questions. We know that we're, we're expecting that, um, you know, we'll work through it, but we're gonna say for help with the electronic AIR submission, please call the Nutrient Management Program main office number, which that office number will, you know, Basically, those calls will then be forwarded out to the folks that will answer those questions. Uh, just so you know, the person that will probably answer most of those questions will be uh, Kendra Keeney, who has been working with our program for a number of years, who's been uh, very diligent in working with entering the AIR data, has been working with the one-stop side of things all this past year, entering the, our AIR data this year and so forth. So she has a lot of experience working with it. Uh, so she will be returning some of those calls. 
along with some of our specialists and so forth. Um, just to kind of start and show you what this form is going to look like now, uh, when you come into it the, and, and you get into the application, one of the things you're going to do is select your county and you're going to answer the question, are you a CAFO or MAFO operation? Yes or no. If it's a no, then you don't get the CAFO, all the CAFO questions um, at the end of the form or um, and so forth. So that's the first step is to do that. You got to put in your MDA operator number and so forth. We are putting required fields in some of these pages so that you, you know, go through the form and fill those out uh, in terms of last name, first name, middle initials, any suffixes you have, so on, your farm operation name, your mailing address, the city, the state defaults to Maryland and zip code. And then of course, you know, if you have cell phone numbers or office phone numbers, you would put those in as well. If you check yes on the CAFO form on the front, on that first section, um, Obviously, it comes up and asks for your MD, MDE AI number, which I see we got we to gotta change that over to MDE AI number on that. Um, so across the top of these of the form, they're kind of set up in tabs. So as you go from one and you click the next, it takes you to the next tab in the process. For example, your farm operation information. You know, again, total farm acres, including pastures and, uh, and your operation type, check all that apply. You'll see that this step down is, is similar to the form uh, and so forth. Unfortunately, we couldn't put numbers in there, but, um, you know, we're working on that. Uh, we are going to have some required fields and, and, and things on each of these tabs that have to be, or a question that has to be answered for you so that you know where you're at, okay? Um, then the next tab would be your account IDs. So for example, we're gonna have a question in there that says, you know, did you add or delete any properties? Yes or no. So if you check no, then basically all this folds up, you know, this part here would fold up and you'd be able to click the next button and keep on rolling through the form, okay? If you did, however, say yes, then you got to do your added or deleted account IDs just as you would on the paper form. Okay, so the next section would be our nutrient use section. You know, are you using nutrients on your farm operation? Um, you would check all that apply and so forth. And again, each tab will have either a question or a required field on it so that you go through it and it knows what questions you would continue to fill out and so forth, all right? Uh, our nutrient management consultant and plan writer information. Again, we're looking for the name of that plan writer, the certificate number for CFOs and our consultants for our certified operators as well. Um, license numbers of our certified consultants, um, the date the plan was written, the beginning date, and um, when that expires. And then of course, if you've got more than one consultant, you can click add another consultant and it would allow you to fill that out as well. Probably doesn't apply to a lot of people, but it does apply to some depending on the types of nutrients you're using. And then of course, uh, the question about total acres of animal manure recommended for land application by the nutrient management plan in that section. And then you would click next to move on at that point in time. Now, you know, for crop production, these are those uh, management questions we talked about and the nursery greenhouse questions. Again, there'll be a required field on here in terms of, you know, do these man are you implementing these management practices and so forth? Yes or no. Um, and, and if you didn't, and it doesn't apply to your operation, if you click no, the, the goal is to have this disappear and then you click next and move on. That is what we're working on uh, for that. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible to move through the sections if certain sections don't apply to you, but allow those that it does apply to to take the time to fill those out. Again, commercial fertilizer, you know, 
we're walking right down through those questions. Acres using variable rate fertilizer application or split application. The, you know, acres where nitrogen was applied based on recommendations from the PSNT and so forth down through there. And then when you're done a section, you would click next to move on to the next section. Uh, again, you know, here is your animal inventory and so forth where you would get that information. So um, essentially you would check if you got beef cows, for example, and you check yes, it opens up the box to ask you how many. If you check no, you keep on rolling down through the, the tab and move on, all right? For poultry, this is like on page two, our poultry questions. Again, when you check yes, it opens up a box. You put in what your animal numbers are in thousands, uh, number of flocks, your poultry integrator, <clears throat> number of poultry houses, total number of square feet in here. Um, and we certainly don't want eight, uh, you know, whatever the measurements of the houses are, we want the actual total square footage in there. Um, and then, of course, coming down through, you got your poultry litter uh, and those questions that we asked now. Um, and I just, I don't have every question on here, but it goes through all those questions related to the poultry section. Then we jump to our manure, uh, which would be our manure other than a uh, 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 poultry section and so forth. Uh, we also ask questions about the storage, uh, how many storage structure you got and what the cubic foot or gallons and tons of that is. And then we got our manure and other organics in this section and those uh, management questions related to that. And then we got our total on farm collected. And, and a couple of these sections, you got a couple areas where if it doesn't apply, you would check none and so forth. But again, there'll be a, still be some required information on these pages to know whether it applies to your operation or not. Um, as far as imported and exported, I put them both on the same slide. They're very similar. For the most part, they're very similar. Uh, again, we'll have a required question that you have to answer with a yes or no, and that, that'll determine how much you see and don't see uh, of it to be able to um, fill out the AIR. Again, it's very similar to the chart, you know, the name of person or the entity, the address, the city, the uh, county. Um, if you're outside of Maryland, then you check the box and it, you know, you put in, put in the county outside of that. Uh, the state defaults to Maryland, you can change it based on where you're exporting things to and so forth. Again, checking the types and adding in the amount of gallons. Um, what was used, what was land applied. Again, if it was so solid manure, it'd be amount in tons, amount used in tons and so forth. And at the bottom of these page, there's just like on the export for each one of the, each one of your sources, when you get done answering those questions, you would just click add another and it would add, bring up another blank section and you'd fill that out and do that. And it automatically saves the information as you're typing it in. So, and, and then, when you're done those sections, you would click next and that confirms the information, you know, put in there. So for the summary of nutrient application, which is the back of the AIR, uh, obviously uh, we listed our crops that we have on the AIR up and down here and they are required fields for you to go through and answer the questions, yes or no, um, if it, you know, first off, it's gonna ask you the number of acres that you planted. Um, then it's going to ask you, yes, did you apply nutrients to that? Yes or no? Uh, if you check yes, it opens up a box then that will allow you to put in your uh, commercial fertilizer, your manure, your biosolids, and your other organic nutrient sources or, or nutrients. Okay. If you check no, you move on to the next crop and, and you just keep moving down through the form and to the, till you get to the next section. All right, and then we have the, the CAFO, MAFO, page five here. Again, there'll be some required information on there. Obviously, there's CAFO forms. 
PAFOs, you know, you need to make sure those are filled out. The um, enforcement of those is certainly handled by a different agency. They're handled by MDE. And, you know, they want all that information, all the information on the AIR filled out completely. So uh, beware of that. But you got a section here, the field by field uh, section of that page five is here to fill out. And obviously, when you're ready to add another field, you just click add another one. Um, and then, of course, you have a, a, the ability to upload your um, uh, manure analysis sheets. You can upload a PDF file and attach it to the form to submit it to MDA. And then MDA would then in turn make sure that MDE gets required information and so forth. Um, as time goes on, hopefully we'll be able to refine this process a little better as MDE gets brought into the one stop system as well. Um, and we'll work through that over time. Then the next thing is obviously the report certification. Now, just so everybody knows, some of this information on here was some of our database stuff like date received. You won't necessarily see that. That would be for our folks to um, that enter data by hand and so forth. But you will have an operator sign off where you check and, and type your name in and so forth, and you agree to it. Now, this is a little different, and just so everybody knows what's going on, you know, this has been kind of consulted with the company that developed this and, and, and so forth um, for operator signature statements. You're gonna have to check all three in order for the form to submit. Basically, the first one is the same information you acknowledge on the AIR. And that is, I acknowledge and agree that the information contained within this 2020 Nutrient Management Annual Implementation Report is true and accurate to the best of my knowledge and a valid nutrient management plan for my operation for calendar years 2021 will be developed and implemented. That's pretty much the same exact statement you sign on the paper for. All right. The second one here is going to acknowledge that you acknowledge and agree that if the Maryland Department of Agriculture's nutrient management finds major errors in reporting that the AIR will be returned to you electronically through the one-stop portable portal for corrections. And that I, as the uh, person signing the form, will have to correct the form and resubmit it through the one-stop portal, okay, to be in compliance with reporting requirements. You know, when we're moving into this electronic age, there's just all these things that we got to account for. Uh, then it's also acknowledged and agreed that if Maryland Department of Agriculture and Nutrient Management finds minor errors in reporting that the AIR will be, can be corrected or will be corrected administratively by the Nutrient Management Program staff. This correction would only be made with consent from the operator listed above, basically by our specialists contacting you, the operator, and asking your permission to change something. So when this thing's getting reviewed by our specialists, they're looking for those errors that may be, that come in. Um, on the paper form, we certainly get, you know, some of those things that we, uh, that are errors when they come in and we have to, you know, contact the operator and, and, and make those adjustments and so forth. Uh, it's the same thing here, you know, but we want you to be aware of that, that we're going to contact you by phone or by email to, to do that, okay? So these three things would be have to be checked in order for the uh, form to be submitted. And then the operator would type in the name and sign off on it. Now, we also want to allow uh, the opportunity for our licensed consulting firms and so forth and companies out there we know a lot of uh, uh, companies work with their operators closely and help them fill out AIRs and so forth. So we acknowledge that and we tried to build that into this system. Okay. Uh, so that would allow that a licensed uh, nutrient management consultant could submit on behalf of an operator the AIR. Okay. Through the electronic submission. Uh, so it's one option that is out there for uh, our nutrient management um, companies that provide services and so forth that they could potentially, you know, submit AIRs on behalf of the operators. Again, they have to acknowledge 
that there's three statements as well. And it's I acknowledge and agree that the information provided within the 2020 annual implementation report is true and accurate to the best of my knowledge and that all information was discussed and obtained from the operator listed above and that the AIR is be, being submitted on behalf of the operator listed above. And then our next one is I acknowledge and agree that this that it was discussed with the operator listed above and a valid nutrient management plan for the operation for calendar year 2021 will be developed and implemented. It is understood that if corrections are needed to the AIR that the Maryland Department of Agriculture will contact the operator and the licensed consultant listed above may have to resubmit the AIR through the one-stop portal. So again, when there's corrections that need to be dealt with, it gets returned to the person that submitted it. So then we would have to, you know, reach out and touch base with both parties, let them know what's going on. And then it's acknowledged and agreed that the operator has been instructed to provide the Maryland Department of Agriculture Nutrient Management Program, you know, a statement that says I've given the, whoever the licensed nutrient management consultant permission to submit my 2020 annual implementation report on my behalf to the Maryland One Stop Quarter electronically for my operation. The statement can be, be provided to us by mail, email, and must contain the signature if mailed and typed if emailed in there. So basically we have to have an operator's statement that they, that they gave you permission to do this for them, okay? And we have to have kind of their acknowledgement you know, after all, the operator is the one that has to deal with any penalties or things that come out later. So we have to kind of have that acknowledgement. Now, if you as the company want to get these statements ahead of time or write something up and have your operator sign it, we are putting the ability for you to be able to upload that statement with the AIR. So if, if you get that statement from your operators, that you're doing these AIRs for, you can upload that right with the AIR and that would be perfectly acceptable. So we're putting a section on there to be able to upload those statements. Um, again, this is the first year of this and we're working through this as, as we can. You will have to put your nutrient management consultant, you'll have to put your name on there as the consultant and your license number and, and, and so forth on the form as well as to who you're submitting it on. Again, that's a lot of information to go through, but you know, we'll work through this. You'll get instructions um, in the mail and certainly as consultants, you know, we're putting this in the newsletters and, and different things. So we'll make, you know, plenty of time available to work with folks. Um, so to keep moving on our proposed changes, to clarify. Um, hey, Brian, I, I hate to interrupt, but would you want to handle the questions about the AIR separately now? Um, or I can, I can I can try to do that. I'm, you know, we're going to have to watch the time a little bit. Yeah, um, there's just a few questions. Um, one is is question specific for the AIR about questions number 45 through 47. Do they apply to all organics? Because the heading indicates that organics um, uh, like they, they seem to only indicate manure. So I don't know if you're sure about questions 45 to 47 on the AIR. Before you got too far ahead, I figured we better. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, again, the, the heading up top is manure slash organics other than poultry. So again, if, if you imported something um, I, I, and, and also understand that this is your own farm generated manure organics. So this is be dealing with your manure that's on your farm, okay? Now number 50 down at the bottom would be picking up potentially some other things that if you brought something in, other organics in and you stored it over um, from 2018 to 2019. But the, the, the 47, 48 and 49 are dealing with your total on-farm collected manure or organics that are on the farm, okay? In terms of that. Um, so that's what those are looking for in regards to that. So we're looking again for your on farm collected manure that you generated on the farm for those questions. Okay. Down at number 50, that's going to pick up 
if you stored other products over one year to the next um, in terms of that. Now, if you brought in um, other type of, um, uh, say, compost or something like that into your farm operation, you're going to pick that up on the imported table where you brought that in and so forth. Again, we're trying to deal with what's collected on the farm here with those questions. And then um, there's a question about where do you enter cover crop acres for question 55. Cover crop, cover crop do not have a nutrient recommendation. Right. Yeah, so if it's a true cover crop, they're not even going to Correct. have it here because it's exactly, okay. Right. Um, alrighty, and then there's a question about how to properly document for horse operators, for example, who give out a lot of small amounts of manure to people who come and pick up. Um, do they all need to be reported individually with the AIR or can it be listed in a group method? You know, it, it, I mean, are we talking a couple or are we talking, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, pages of people. If we're talking about three people picking stuff up, you know, certainly put it in the form. If we're talking about pages of people, then we may have to, you know, work with it on a case by case basis and try to, you know, summarize it a little bit. But, you know, that's where I'm going to stand at this point. Okay. And then there's a lot of questions about um, for farmers who don't have internet access. Um, or, you know, digital access, do they still have the other option to do mail-in? Um, as, as, I, as I stated before this year, everybody will be mailed the paper copy. And as we move forward to the electronic, you know, as we continue to move forward and develop the electronic AIR, we will obviously have to have provisions for those that don't have internet capabilities in the state and work with them on a case-by-case -case basis to get that worked out. Um, are you able to save your work and come back when you're working through this form online, or do you have to finish it all in one go? To my, to my understanding, I believe you can, you can save it and come back. It should save everything you've got to that point. And if you have to come back, you should be able to get to it. I believe that was how we left it with that. Okay, great. Um, there's some questions in the chat about CEUs, but I'll let Dwight answer those in the chat. I think just about it's you know, maybe on a year by year basis, whether we and uh, whether you provide those or not for doing this. Um, and there's a question about will CEUs be provided for uh, mailed in AIRs as well or just the digital? No, not not mailed in just the electronic, just just the electronic AIR. It's an, it's an incentive to do the electronic AIR um, is what it is. Right. Okay. And then we've already answered the question that yes, the uh, consultants are able to help with that. I think there's some question about are specialists available to still help operators do these, or do you think it will the the responsibility will lay more on the consultants to help the operators um, fill these out? Well, I mean, obviously this year is going to be a little different than in the past years. Our our specialists have always been available to answer questions and so forth. Some have, you know, worked with operators individually and, and different things like that. Obviously with COVID restrictions, and I will talk about our, our office arrangements and stuff at the end of the talk here, um, but all of our specialists have cell phones now and can be reached at any time during normal business hours through cell phones and so forth. So they are available for phone calls and those types of things. Uh, to help producers walk through this um, and so forth. Uh, as far as COVID restrictions this year, you know, lim we, you know, as, as everybody's doing, we're limiting our contact with folks and, and so forth um, and, and going to deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis and as needed. But certainly we're trying to do as much as we can over the phone and so forth. Great. Um so I'll let you get on with your presentation. There's a few more questions rolling in just about helping people who don't have internet access and during the pandemic and stuff like that. Um, but if we have time at the end, maybe you can address that. Okay. Um, 
yeah, well, we'll let you finish up and we'll see what other questions we have time for. Rest assured, if you've put your question in the uh, in the chat box, we'll find a way to get you that answer, be it in the chat box or email later. Well, is there um, a way we can copy those questions out to a Word document? And absolutely, we yep. them, We can at least try to get back to the folks? Yes. Okay. All right. All right, so we'll talk, we'll move on to our proposed changes to clarify our nutrient application requirements. I think we brought this up maybe a little bit last year, and of course, you know, with this with 2020 being the year that it has, you know, these things are still out there and, and still in the works um, in terms of proposed uh, changes to clarify our nutrient application requirements. Our spring and summer time frames have been defined as March 1 to June 30th. Uh, summer would be defined as July 1st to September 9th, and fall and winter timeframes have not changed. That would still be uh, September 10th to December 15th, which, by the way, is today, or December 15th today. Uh, we will define what pastures and hay fields are for nutrient application in terms of needing to have a minimum of 75% vegetative cover, must be predominantly grass or grass legume mix and cover uh, the spring, fall, and summer timeframes again. And I just wanna clarify, we did have some questions come in in regards to pasture, um, you know, and, and we are consulting with our, um, our forage specialist on that with the university as well to get some clarification on some of the different types of things that go on with pasture operations and so forth. Uh, but we want to, you know, we, we need to make sure um, if we're putting nutrients out there, that we're putting them out for a crop, okay? We are, we are truly putting them on for a crop for nutrients to be used by a crop, and we're not putting them on a weed patch or something like that. Um, you know, so that's what this is in regards to and so forth. And then, of course, with our soil amendments and stuff, and we've already started doing this, you know, requiring folks to have proof of current registration of the products needing to be registered as soil amendments and conditioners and so forth, all right? Uh, quickly through the phosphorus management tool and regulations, and I know we're looking at some time here, uh, we need an immediate ban, you know, as you reminded, anything over 500 can't receive any phosphorus. We started the transition phases back in 2018 and the PMT requires consultants to report every six years the soil FIV data of all the fields out there for nutrient management plans they've written. The next data collection begins in 2021. You've all seen these slides probably before about, you know, the PMT changes the management requirements for farms that are required to use the tool. Certainly our subsurface drainage is the primary driver on the, um, when we start looking at things on the lower, you know, on the Eastern shore and so forth coincides with some of our poultry operations in the high pea soils. Our distance to surface water also affects the PMT pretty good uh, and certainly affects things differently in other parts of the states. And again, we build in incremental changes to work with that and so forth. We all went through the process of creating the tier groups for that, which determines where you fell into the transition phases. So, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. You've seen this one as well before. We're sitting here now in 2020 and finishing up, you know, working and getting ready to finish up and start 2021, where everybody's doing this and then transitioning to PMT in 2022. Um, and of course, as we've talked about this in phases, depending where your risk category is, and where you fell out on the tier groups and your transition management phases, you got your low, medium, high. Um, and then of course, that determines what you can do as far as P, your uh, P application. And as you go diagonally across the chart, certainly it gets more restrictive. In the end, PMT becomes more restrictive than what the uh, phosphorus site index was in the end, depending where you are in low, medium, or high, okay? and it's dealing strictly with phosphorus at that point in time. All right, nutrient application setbacks. Just a reminder that PMT surface water determinations are different 
please refer to the PMT technical guide for any further clarification on that. Um, again, a nutrient application setback is a vegetated area prescribed with where nutrient containing material may not be applied as measured from the edge of surface waters, including perennial and intermittent streams. Um, and then we've got that there. So again, we're looking at the main streams here. Uh, I just put a screenshot of the technical guide. If, you, if it's related to the phosphorus management tool, a setback in the phosphorus management tool, please refer to the University of Maryland phosphorus management technical guide for the definitions related to the PMT. Okay. Just as a reminder, the, you've all heard these things before and, and, and so forth. These are our standard setbacks for our application. Again, 35 foot setback required for a broadcast, uh, spinner splashes, you know, that type of thing. A directed spray application or injection of crop nutrients is a 10 foot setback, except in perennial forage crops grown for hay or pasture. Vegetated area in the vegetation in the 10 foot setback area may not include those crop plants. So you gotta have something else other than corn or beans or whatever that row crop was. Um, pastures and hay fields are subject to that 10 foot setback. Again, nutrients may not be applied mechanically within the setback, except as provided in subsection 2B6 of the manual. Livestock shall be excluded from the setback to prevent direct deposition of nutrients. What does that mean? Some sort of stream fencing. Okay, unless you can come up with a soil conservation plan or somebody can write that soil conservation plan and you have minimal animals on a large amount of acreage that those animals are not disturbing something, you know, bottom line is if it's an alternative to it, it has to work. Okay, so there are things that could be looked at, you know, in terms of grazing plans and, and different things. Um, if you can get that written and, and, and approved um, and submit that, we would certainly adopt that and, and work with it. But obviously, you know, right now, fencing seems to be what most uh, things are required to keep animals out of the streams. Okay. Uh, again, sacrifice lots need less than, um, with less than 75% grass lagoon mix, shall maintain a 35 foot setback. This is an example of the fact that your 10 foot is your no nutrient application zone, but you do have your directed spray um, application where your planters, uh, your spray rigs and so forth can go through and put those nutrients down up to that 10 foot section. Obviously your broadcast um, nutrients got to stay at the 35 foot. Again, a quick reminder on our current regulations at this point of what spring and summer is March 1 to September 9th. Again, you, you're required to inject or incorporate within 48 hours, except those operations that are managing to obtain the benefits of no-till farming. Again, you got the uh, snow greater than an inch or ground frozen uh, two inches. MDA reserves the right to incorporate for the incorporation of organic nutrients on a case-by-case -case basis. These are general statements. Again, this is more in relation to complaints and dealing with complaints. Um, it's the true option you have to deal with some, you know, materials that are, you know, kind of ugly and odor and so forth um, and different things. But it's really, this is mainly used when it comes up for complaints. Um, our fall applications, again, um, applications to existing crop or crop to be planted. Fallow crop land must be planted uh, in the cover crop by November 15th. This has nothing to do with the state cover crop program. This is a, a nutrient management regulation that you have, you cannot apply manure to fallow ground. You have to have a cover crop planted. Okay, so you cannot just put the manure out there on fallow ground. So, and if you're planting between November 15th and December 15th, you've got to have vegetative cover. So you're gonna to need to have some sort of vegetative cover. So as consultants, you're developing these plans and as operators, you're making plans for these fall clean outs and so forth, you really need to take this into consideration, okay? Um, 
things, you know, we're being tested every year on some of these things. And it's, you know, we work with folks on these things, but we're getting tested too. So be aware that, you know, you need to really be taking this into consideration and implementing this as part of your nutrient management plan to deal with this, okay? Application is prohibited when soil is saturated, grounds covering snow greater than an inch or the grounds hard frozen. MDA reserves, again, reserves that right to incorporation. Again, winter application of nutrients only under the current regulations now. We have passed February 20th of 2020. So even those small operations now were required to have storage in place for manure to get through the winter months. Obviously, you know, we, you know, we're coming around on that now. This is the first winter after that. So we'll see what comes up. But the bottom line is the only manure, and it has to be an emergency situation, the only manure that can go out is liquid manure at this point. Solid manure has to be stacked, okay? If you have to do emergency spreading, you need to contact the Maryland Department of Agriculture, uh, either directly through the main number or contact the regional nutrient management specialist. This is gonna be something that is, every year we've been getting a little more um, restrictive on what we can allow, okay? We have to be mindful of these things, okay? We recognize that there's emergencies for liquid storages. We understand that. MDA is well aware of that, okay? But we have to be following our guidelines and working with that, okay? So again, applications have to be made in the existing vegetative cover. No application within 100 foot of surface waters, all right? No applications on so slopes greater than 7%. No application when the ground is covered with <coughs> one inch or greater of snow, hard frozen two inches. The soil is saturated. Application based on one year crop removal of phosphorus or uh, 50 pounds of N, whatever caps you first on that application rate. And again, whatever N is applied during the winter will be subtracted and deducted off of your spring recommendations. So um, consultants and, and Operators, consultants certainly, you know, discuss this with your operators and bring it to their attention that these things are in there um, and in the regulations. Let your operators, uh, operators, please understand that you need to try to make as much provisions for manure storage as possible, recognizing that there could still be an emergency situation on a liquid operation. All right, so you know. We will be asking for, when you contact us for one of these spreading events, uh, we started this at the end of last uh, season, but we are gonna be asking for proof that you need to spread, okay? So be aware of that. That proof can come in multiple ways. It can come in the form of pictures. It can come in the form of us coming out to verify it at the farm. Um, again, just be aware of that being out there and let us know what's going on. It's important that you contact us and let us know what's going on because people are watching what's going on. And I'm just making, letting everybody know that. Uh, the current nutrient management plan form certification for MAX, I'm putting this in here. The MAX, um, Norm may mention this later, but again, required for, uh, um, when you go in for MAX program, um, requirements, you'll have to have the current nutrient management plan form filled out as an operator and so forth. Again, it's required for the max application must be signed by certified consultant and by the operator must be filled out completely. And again, operator keeps the originals and can make copies for the soil conservation district and will be cross checked with the nutrient management program and so forth. And may be may result in operators being contacted by us and so forth in, in a potential implementation review. Uh, just wanna bring up the fact that, as we all know with this year, with the current COVID situation, we all ended up doing a lot of work from home and still working from home and, and different things. Uh, we are doing our, we did change our um, 
implementation reviews and are given folks the option of trying to work through an electronic review with the with you. Uh, we are still trying, we are working with and doing implementation reviews. There is obviously, you know, still the, you know, if we can't get it electronically, then we would still try to set something up with you at the farm to do that. Um, we do employ all the social distancing guidelines and, and wearing masks and so forth. So operators don't tell, you know, just be aware we do have to wear masks when we come to your farm and so forth or meet with anybody. We do have to follow all those guidelines. But I want you to be aware that now all of, and I'm letting this here for anybody who wants to write numbers down at this point, uh, you know who your specialists are based on what county you're in. We have, they all have cell phones now. Uh, so that will be the case. Um, be aware that a couple of our regional offices, we did some consolidating of regional offices and you will now be mailing your if you mail in a form to us or mail anything to us, it'll go directly to a PO box in that area. For example, Region 1, Keith Potter will go to PO box 459 in Hancock. For Darren, it'll go to PO box 850 in Bel Air. Um, and then we have uh, uh, Whalen Anderson as well, PO box 652 in Leonardtown. Um, Howard Callahan will go to PO box 4. 549 in Cordova, and Steve Celeste will go to P.O. Box 340 in Meridale. Um, so please uh, try to get these numbers. Um, again, we will hopefully make, you know, this will be available on the <coughs> paper copy of the form and everything. So that's where we are at this point. And with that, I, I'll stop there. Okay, Brian. And unfortunately, Brian, we're running really short on time, so we'll just wait and have to answer these questions later. And uh, uh, Emily is going to mail out the uh, slides, so uh, don't worry about those telephone numbers. If you didn't get them, uh, you'll have those. That information will be coming to you, so you can get it that way. Um, and, and again, we will answer all of your questions. Uh, it's just, uh, and we may get to some at the end. If we have a few minutes at the end, we'll get to them, but we need to keep moving ahead now. Uh, so next we're going to get, uh, I believe Hans, uh, Hans Schmidt, our assistant secretary for resource conservation has rejoined the meeting. Uh, if he is, Hans uh, is going to give a, a little bit of an update on what's been going on with uh, PMT, uh, mainly from the standpoint of uh, what's been going on, what's been presented to the PMT advisory.